My name is Neil Kelly. I'm a regional extension agent in southeast Alabama. I'm going to give a quick uh, update on Cowpeka Curlio here in the Wiregrass region. You know, southern peas is a very common crop for our growers in the southeast part of the state. Um, you know, peas have many different pests. We have things like aphids and thrips, your common leaf-footed bugs, stink bugs, various caterpillar species. But the one pest that really causes us the most trouble is the Calpica culio. Most all these other pests we inadvertently control simply trying to control the Calpica culio. You know, one of the problems that we have with that insect is that the, the curculio has become resistant to all of our pyrethroids. So pretty much all the products that we have in our arsenal uh, to help combat insect issues in southern peas, this insect has, the, has become resistant to those chemistries. Just a little background on them, uh, you know, Primarily, we see it in the southeastern U.S. We see it in southeast Alabama. We see it in southwest Georgia. It's starting to become a little bit of an issue in southwest Alabama. The mouth parts of this insect is at the tip of a curved snout. So that mouth part actually acts as a feeding mouth part as well as in the females as an ovipositor. So that's also the way that they lay their eggs. Egg laying is very heavy in July when your cow peas uh, are available. Female can have 100 plus eggs inside of one pod. The larva goes through four different instar changes and matures around 10 days, which it chews out of the pea as a small white grub falls to the ground where it pupates over the next 10 days or so. So we're looking at a 30 to 40 day per generation. The adults will, will overwinter in the soil or native vegetation, typically emerge in April or May of the following year. This is just a small picture showing the, the different life, uh, life cycle stages. You can see as the grubs mature, they fall from the pod where they pupate in the ground. They emerge as the small weevil. Uh, like I say, somewhere between 30 and 40 days for all this to occur. They begin feeding, they'll feed on the peas and begin to lay eggs as well. Talk a little bit about the population dynamics of the Calpe Cucurlio. And, and this is a slide that was taken from Dr. David Riley over at UGA, in which they've done um, several years of research with this insect as well, mapping out the, the population. And if you will notice, um, and there in 2012, we saw a, a small population around April 10th. You look on out to about July 10th, August 10th, we see a huge spike in the population. And then the subsequent generation in September and October. Uh, the 2013 data, you see the same kind of spikes in populations. They're just a, a month or two later. So, you know, sometimes the weather will cause these generations to appear a little earlier or a little later or the availability of food uh, will cause different spikes different times of the year but you can see how you typically will see two generations a year you know so how do they cause injury primarily on feeding the males because there are male and female weevils the males cause the feeding damage um, they'll feed on the leaves blossoms uh, the pods themselves, the part that becomes a real issue in southern peas, like when we shell out the peas and we find the bug stings on the pea and we find the little white larva, it's from where those females are laying those eggs at the feeding site. And it causes that shallow little cavity. It will typically callus over. The little grub will develop inside and then chew its way down into the pea pod itself where it spends all four of its life cycles uh, in star stages uh, before it chews its way out of the pod. You know, this causes an irreversible damage um, to our crop. You know, we've seen upwards of 60, 70 percent loss in many crops. Um, I have many growers who simply at a certain point in the year, they just disc up the field, uh, abandon it and move on to a different planting. 
Here's a picture of what the damage actually looks like. You can see the bottom right corner, uh, the little larva as it chews its way out of the pod. So we've had a couple of little IPM research plots going here in Headland the last several years. Uh, these are replicated field plots. We have been testing various chemicals, pyrethroids, some labeled, some not labeled, just trying to find something that would work. And, and then the mindset was, if we can find a product that will control them, then we'll go about trying to get a label uh, to make it legal to use these products. So played with several, several different mixtures, tank mixes of chemicals. Uh, we've tried um, biologicals as well as your synthetic pyrethroids. We've tried so uh, soil treatments as well as foliar treatments. This gets into some of our data slides. Talking a little bit, all this is percent seed damage from Cucurlio. It goes back to 2015, which if you'll notice was kind of a wet year. This was one of our first treatments and, you know, the chemicals that we used and uh, all the different rotations is, is not terribly important. The biggest thing to look at is you look down there at the bottom, you know, four days after treatment three on July 20th, we were still seeing with all of our, all of our different controls, we were still seeing upwards of 18% damage. You bump on down to July 30th, you see that damage starting to increase as we move further into this season, and we're up as high as 27, 28% damage. Carry that on out another month to August 6th. Uh, you can see as much as up to 90, 91% damage. This moves on to, to 2016, uh, which 2016 happened to be a little bit of a drought year. Again, we changed up treatments. The treatments here are really not that important. Again, just looking at some of the numbers, it kind of paints a picture for you. Uh, seven days after uh, treatment two, August the 15th, you know, we're still seeing as much as 76% on our untreated, but, you know, 54.8, 52, 54.2% in our treated plots. So we're seeing a difference. Um, you know, it is helping. But in the world of research, if you look at that, those still are not significant differences. Uh, so that's kind of important to notice here. You know, we do see some differences here, uh, but none of them were proven to be significant. So what we started doing is we started rating them compared to the control, like how much better than the control was this treatment? How much better than the control was, was this treatment? Uh, because we just were not getting any scientific, uh, scientific uh, significant differences uh, between our treatments. So bump over to seven days after treatment four, that put us around August 29th. Uh, you can see we're still getting 60, 62% damage out of some of them. This bumps to 2017. 2017 was kind of a wet year for us. And again, if you look at all the different values, you see that there's still no significant difference there. Uh, and we're still ranging upwards of 40 to 50, 55, 56% damage, 57 in one instance. Uh, so still what I consider unacceptable levels of control. 2018 was typically a wet year. And the reason I'm telling you this wet, dry, wet, dry, and and the reason we were kind of keeping up with that is because it doesn't really seem to have a, a difference in their activity. They move when it's wet, they move when it's dry. Um, we're still seeing unacceptable levels of damage uh, in all different weather situations, weather scenarios. Um, seven days after treatment four in 2018, that put us at August 27th. You can see 70, 80% late season that's that second generation spike in numbers so you can see those kind of late late season peas uh, really really get hit hard 2019 again if you'll notice the seven days after treatment to august 5th graph uh, we were seeing damage but it but it wasn't wasn't terrible um, but when you come in there toward the end of the August, 
after that first life cycle, that first generation, that second generation hits, uh, we essentially get very little control of those second generations. So, you know, where does that put us? Um, I guess this thing is start with what we do know. Uh, they're highly mobile insects. They can infest new fields the very first year. Um, they do have really small wings. They typically stay folded up. They don't fly a lot, but they do have the ability to fly. One thing that's very interesting about this insect, and it also makes them hard to control, uh, they will play dead. As they see someone walking through the field or they see a tractor coming through the field spraying, they will freeze, kind of ball up like a little roly-poly. They'll fall to the ground. Um, and then they're actually kind of protected by the canopy of the peas. Uh, so sometimes I think just um, getting good coverage on these insects becomes an issue for us. You know, the second generations of curculios seem to always overwhelm the crop. We can kind of control the first generation a little bit. The second generation will just about completely destroy the crop. Uh, we're recommending to start insecticide treatments earlier than normal. A lot of our people would typically start spraying peas at the site of first bloom. I think that's waiting too long. We really need to start treatment two to three weeks ahead of flowering. They are there. They are feeding. Um, they just don't start laying eggs until those uh, pods are present. So start spraying earlier than normal. You're going to have to kind of evaluate on your own circumstances, evaluate the different varieties of peas you plant, see if one might have a tendency to be a little more tolerant than others. Um, you're going to have to continually rotate crops to try to prevent that pest buildup. We recommend as soon as you get through picking a variety that you go in there and that you disc that crop up, try to eliminate as much of a food source as you can. Um, We've been using what they call a PBO8. It's a um, synergist product. So we're recommending that you mix some type of synergist product with your pyrethroids. You're going to have to do tank mixes. Um, you know, a lot of these chemicals, they have maximum amounts that can be applied throughout the year. So you need to look at that, figure how many sprayings you're going to have. And you're going to have to buy several different products to rotate when you spray. You know, we're still looking into alternative insecticides, something that you can apply to the soil um, to try help give a little bit of control there. And you're going to have to spray them frequently. You're probably going to be at a three to five day interval uh, as long as the label will permit that. And that's one reason you're going to have to have several different products because we're going to be spraying these things weekly. Uh, kind of looking ahead, where are we going to go from here? We're going to continue some evaluation of alternative insecticides and different soil treatments. See if there's any way that we can, can disrupt that life cycle as they pupate in the soil uh, to help control that second generation, to help control that population boom, if you will. Uh, we're going to play a little bit with different types of trap crops and different types of pest exclusion systems. Uh, of course, these are both, both small and large scale uh, pest exclusion systems just to see if that might be a feasible alternative. Some different references here. We've got a couple of publications out, Calpica Curlio Management in Alabama. Uh, you can see one there from Georgia as well. Dr. David Riley, those guys uh, over at UGA Tifton, um, they've done a lot of work with the cow pica curlio and they have some really good resources that are out uh, so i recommend you taking a look at those as well we do have some different youtube videos that are available uh, on our beginning farm project channel and here's just a few more different commercial horticultures resources available in alabama we have our ipm newsletter we have our phone app that we've been working to develop and we continue uh, to update and also we have the southeastern u.s vegetable crop handbook the 2020 copies are out now if anyone is looking for one of those get with your uh, local extension agents